we have Barbara Yella, and she provides, she's going to discuss the use of e-portfolios as tools that showcase student learning and provide students with a larger, more meaningful purpose to illustrate how e-portfolios can inspire critical thinking as students assemble their best work. So, thank you, Barbara, and... What's that? I need a. I need a. Okay. Um, I work at a college. I work at two colleges. I work at Harpen, that's almost right across the street, and I also work at American College of Education, that is a for-profit school. But let me just tell you something. It's totally online, and. Everything you've heard about for-profit schools does not hold true for American College of Education. We really work our students. We work them very hard. Most of them are already teaching while they are pursuing their uh, master's degree. So um, I'm responsible for teaching courses in the two departments. One's instructional technology, and the other one is um, instructional design. And I also... <laughs> I'm responsible for coordinating, um, doing all the capstone, which is our e-portfolio. Students don't graduate unless they pass their e-portfolio. <clears throat> While e-portfolio is a separate course, anybody can set it up for their students. It can go on any learning management system, mm -hmm. any way you decide to do it. We used to use Task Stream. Does anybody know Task Stream? We got out of Task Stream. Yes. Okay. <laughs> It costs a lot of money, and there's no reason for it. If you have a learning management system, you can set this up for your students very, very easily. You set it up just like a regular course. You grade it like a regular course. You have rubrics like a regular course. And students have access to it from the third course they start to take out of however many they take, like 18 courses. So they, when they start by the third course, they're aware this is what they have to do. They're gearing up for this. They know they can't graduate, but additionally, everything they create can move on for job interviews <coughs> and for employment purposes, and they can put it on their websites, their personal websites. So they're really working very hard at this, and we, we help them. We help them all the way through. Um, first of all, the idea that an e-portfolio is a showcase of student learning and also hard skills, which you'll see. Um, the students have to think. They have to think critically, because every time they put something up, they also are responsible for creating a rationale statement. Why did I choose this, and how does it relate to the program outcome? We have lots of program outcomes, and every one of the artifacts is chosen because it meets the requirement of one of the program outcomes. So when I say non-static, I mean you can put something up, you change it as a student, you move it around, you decide, no, I think I like this one in this class better. It meets the program outcome. How does it meet the program outcome? They write the rationale, they speak to their instructors, they get feedback, and everything changes and it's vibrant. It's not just something they do at the very end. Um, learning, these are learning records. They provide evidence of achievement assembled by the student under strict guidelines, however, very strict guidelines. I think if you just let students put anything up with an e-portfolio, it's not going to work. So we have guidelines and we have a detailed student manual that they access online. And it's amazing how many by the end of this process haven't seen it. So we've now created a video that they see in their third course. And I send them periodically so that they really get the hang of how to do it. So it's not a surprise at the end that, oh my goodness, I have 14 artifacts due. Um, the e-portfolio is graded at the very end in the final course. And when I grade, um, I use rubrics. So the e-portfolio contents, student philosophy and goal statements must have. Um, they can do that any way they want. It can be a video. It can be a paper. It can be a wiki, a blog, anything they want. Um, they have 14 artifacts per hour um, for each of the seven program outcomes. One is a requirement by the school. The other one they get to choose, which 
artifact of all my courses do I think meets this program <coughs> outcome, and how? How do they? Um, each one. So um, they also have to create a LinkedIn account, and they have um, a paper due for scholarly APA purposes. So we make sure to hammer that in early. Um, and then they have an original contribution that showcases their one area of expertise, and they have to do something outside in the public. And however they want to do that, create a website, present it <coughs> at a conference, they do that. They write up a paper about it, very short, and then that goes into the ePortfolio. It's their choice. They can do whatever they want, as long as it's public. By the way, I decided not to use PowerPoint for this. And I created this with Storyline. So does anybody know Storyline? Do you like it? Love it. Great. OK. It's not normally something you'd use for a presentation, so it, this is a little bit odd. But um, what do students place in their e-portfolio? Um, profile reflections, podcasts, video, blogs, uh, wikis, papers, research. Um, they do mind maps a lot in our courses. They post their mind maps and discussions of their mind maps. Um, and recommendation letters can go up in the ePortfolio. <clears throat> Evidence-based rubrics, we create them. We work really hard. We have seven different rubrics. Those are the general areas we discuss in our rubrics. Um, reflection, that's a big one for us. Critical thinking. It has to show in that reflection. Um, connection, knowledge <coughs> to experience after what did I learn and what am I doing with it out in the real world. Um, knowledge applies across disciplines. And ethical proficiency, um, students, uh, if you're a teacher, you have to be very careful about teaching your students copyright. And that's one thing we stress here, copyright. And we have to make sure when our students get out, they understand not only copyright, but how to teach it to their own students, how to make sure their own students are following copyright and fair use laws. Um, initiative, um, what are they doing in their own school settings? That's part of it. How are they taking their knowledge at our school and using it and becoming a part or creating communities of learning in their own schools? Um, scholarly writing, yes, <laughs> goes without saying. It's the least favorite, I think. Um, critical self-reflection. I did use Mentimeter. I use Mentimeter polls a lot in my e-courses. Um, they're free. Um, here's what some students said. I guess you can read this. Can you guys read that at all? It's kind of kind of blew up funny, but the students basically are saying that the process of putting together the portfolio caused them to remember things they had completely forgotten and relearn it. Um, it affected their growth and reinforced the memory and understanding of key concepts. It shows me I've grown. It's put my work in perspective, helped organize my thoughts. It's a great way to see what you have done so far, how you develop, and how you change your goals as you proceed through the program. To reflect, reflective practice. Um, Allows me to work with the emotional aspects of behavior change. Uh, regular education ignores this dynamic. I'm not exactly sure what the student means, but I think they mean that they really worked very, very hard. And how did it change their attitude towards their own students, perhaps? Um, when learning is taking place without the student realizing it, the student's saying, I didn't even know what I was learning until I put it in one place. And when I saw it up there, I was really proud of myself. I get that. I get that quite a lot. Uh, being able to track my journey through the Capstone Project was challenging and worthwhile. And uh, the process helped me be more comfortable making decisions, sticking with them, and following through until completion. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yep. OK. Um, I have some examples from the student work. Oh, these students are <coughs> all active teachers. And they teach in all the disciplines. So this, let's see, when you click on her, she's very happy that you chose her. And this is her PowerPoint presentation. Um, was created as a reflection on information about internet literacy. And she learned how she will apply and share her knowledge with her students and colleagues. So she created this to show 
how she learned to write a paper. She had to put everything together in a cohesive style. And this is actually a PowerPoint presentation that she chose to transition, the box transition. That's what it's doing. But the idea is she wrote a, a reflection about um, how she learned about um, and how she's going to teach these ideas with her students. He, his is completely different. His reflection on learning is a series of cartoons. And he um, reflected on how the information learned helped him use website evaluation. They also have to learn what websites are good. They have to teach their students how to research on the internet. So it's a big part of what we teach them. And he chose that idea for his presentation. <coughs> Some of these have um, noise. OK, here is a website this student created for technology and education. It's a WordPress website. And he will now continue this. And actually, I find a lot of the students, when they create websites, they continue the websites. And they keep the websites open to students, open to their parents, open to um, anybody who needs to know what's going on in their classroom. So this forces them, actually, to put their work out there in the public. And that's another good reason why students should be doing this. It's very, very structured for them and pushes them beyond what they would normally be doing in a classroom because it's public. Anything that's public gets more attention. People pay much more uh, attention to the details, and they want their work to look really strong, especially if it's going out to the parents. This cannot be displayed in a frame. This is a video this person created about teaching new media and keeping her students engaged. And she used Powtoon, which is a marvelous free video creation for your students who would, she's done a, a wonderful job here. Um, you can use your voice if you want to. Um, and all the icons are included for free in the basic Powtoon, P-O-W-T-O-O-N.com. Um, students love to create videos. Thanks. We looked everywhere. He created a wonderful website. This is another educational technology uh, blog she created, and then she shared it with the rest of her school. And she also started a ed tech. Um, community program that um, I think they meet weekly with a bag lunch and they discuss technology issues in the classroom. That did not exist before she went through this curriculum. This is another instructional design website and she discussed at length in her reflection how um, she chose to become an instructional designer and how her program doing all these hands-on things uh, really made her um, become a much better instructional designer. This guy works for the New York Public Library, and he just um, he built an entire course in one of our courses, because we teach them storyline in our program. He built a course that he then will show, and each person who works for the New York Department of Library will be taking his course. He created in, in my course, and it's really wonderful. And these are e-courses the students are building, so no need for you know, big classrooms for the students. They can do it as their own. They can do it at night. They can do it at any time. So that's what we're teaching them. These students also, when they go home from work at night, they work on their e-portfolios. This is something that's done round the clock for them. And this is a talking about how you can help students who are challenged. We wrote a lot, a great deal to work with special education students, how he works with students who are struggling. And here's some, just some things to remember. It is managed by the user. You organize student learning, and you show off all their hard skills. I think you know what I mean by hard skills at this point. What kind of videos can I make? How do I teach? How do I engage my students? What kind of software are my students using? So in this case, it's not that they're using the software. It's that they are teaching their students how to use the software. Putting the software in the hands of the students we use free. Everything is free. We really don't pay for anything. Our students don't buy books 
because by the time the books come in, the course is over. So everything we find and use is articles, and everything is totally free. Um, you can find a whole lot of amazing things online. Um, if you want some ideas, you can email me afterward. Um, so the idea is you have to let the students have early access, and you have to have strict requirements. Dedicated space on a website with their manual. They can find it anytime they need it. Um, we have video. We did find that we needed a video to show them how to access everything to explain what we meant by a rationale statement. Um, and it, it's um, the students get feedback throughout. Like so someone will write me during a course and say, "I'm thinking of putting this in my portfolio. Do you have any suggestions?" Yeah, I do. And I write them back. And it's amazing how much Skype can accomplish because I can show them my my. Um, Screen, or they can show me their screen. I love Skype very much. Um, so, the bottom line is everything is transferable <coughs> an interview or employment. 